quick review of the main English speaking countries. Um, the drop off in these states is continuing. Weird how the United Kingdom and Canada have now got virtually identical numbers of new cases. So overall, I think that graph is encouraging, but um, the deaths, new confirmed uh, COVID-19 deaths per million per capita again. Um, the United States had a bit of a stutter here, going down more slowly, going down more quickly in the UK, still not insignificant. Canada and of course Australia and New Zealand always... Um, leading the way. So you are most welcome to today's talk. And it is Friday the 12th of March, not as I said yesterday, April. I hope that didn't cause too much uh, disorientation or indeed <laughs> consternation. Right, straight down to business. Um, first of all, there's some not so good news, then there's some, there's some good news to follow up. Now, um, the not so good news. Um, well, really, we knew this already. We, we knew there was an increased risk of uh, an increased mortality risk, basically an increased risk of dying from the new UK B117 variant. We've known this, but this is now confirmed in official data and uh, peer reviewed studies. So um, this is based on uh, this is published in British Medical Journal, uh, risk of mortality in patients with SARS coronavirus 2 variant. Variant of concern 2020-12-1 or B117 or the UK or the Kent variant, whatever you want to call it. Now, big sample size, uh, 55,000 matched pairs of participants. So um, these are people that tested positive between the 1st of October 2020 and the 29th of January 2021. So they took people that tested positive and matched those against people that uh well, t t people that tested positive for the new variant and people that tested positive for the old variant to see what the difference was between the two groups. So really, I mean, that, that, that's a cohort of about 110,000 there. So this is, this, is, um, this is good scale data and gives accurate, accurate results. Uh, followed up until the 12th of March. So some, some didn't get the full 28 days follow up, but most did. Uh, deaths within 28 days of the first SARS coronavirus 2 positive tests were what they were looking for. And the mortality hazard ratio associated with infection with the new variant of concern, the B117, compared to the old variant 1.64. So we see a 64% increase. So that's quite a significant uh, increase, it has to be said. Uh, but that is, uh, that is the relative risk between the two variants. The overall risk... Uh, it doesn't look quite so bad, but it's still uh, an increase in deaths from 2.5 per thousand detected cases to 4.1 detected cases. So that's 0.25 to 0.41 percent. So that is now um, that that's now well known. This this is now the situation: 64 percent increased risk of death and about a 35 percent increased transmissibility. So that's that's the change there, 2.5 to 4.1 per thousand detected cases. Now, multiply that up by a lot of cases, by a significant outbreak, and you put significant uh, stress on, on healthcare facilities, which is still one of my concerns for the states, but more on that in a minute. So that was not so good news, um, but confirming what we already knew, really, it's it's nothing. Uh, show you that in a minute. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing dramatically new. Now, um, better news: the Novavax vaccine phase three trials going well. Uh, Fifteen thousand people in the UK, thirty thousand in the United States and Mexico is going to report in April. Two doses, intramuscular injection, kept in the fridge, normal fridge temperatures, easy to transport. Um, initial efficacy was saying eighty nine point three percent from UK data, so looking good. But we'll see it's not quite as good as that because the variants have changed a bit. There was a much lower uh, efficacy in South Africa, but we're going to give figures now. So this is kind of what we knew before this report from, from Novavax. Um, developed a new version to combat the South Africa variant. So they are developing a new version of this vaccine now. And it's protein-based. 
So here, what they do in this particular vaccine is they put the gene that codes for the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein into a yeast, actually. I'm pretty sure it's a yeast. And so you can brew it up just like beer and then get rid of the yeast. And then you get the protein that the yeast is made just like yeast will make alcohol. And this genetically modified yeast, once it's been produced, of course, you can send a batch of it to anywhere in the world and they can start making it as well. So the yeast makes the protein and the protein mimics or is the same as the shape as the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein. So when that's injected into the arm, it's not like an RNA vaccine that has to go into the cells. And it's, it's not like an adenovirus vector vaccine that has to go into the cells as well and make a, uh, facilitating, facilitating the body's own cells producing the antigen. Here the antigen's just there straight away, so those processes are bypassed. And um, th th that's the protein-based vaccine. And, and once, it's, once it's made, large amounts can be produced quite readily. So actually, you know, in the next years, we're probably going to be using a lot more protein based vaccines. They take a bit longer to get going because you've got to get the genetic information in, into the DNA and that DNA has to get into the yeast and then you have to brew up the yeast to produce the protein. So it takes a bit longer to facilitate than the, uh, the, than the messenger RNA vaccines, which can be made very quickly. But once they're made, uh, scaling up is eminently feasible. Uh, US government's put in 1.6 billion, so that's obviously been taken seriously. Uh, Pune, uh, in Indian Institute of Serology, is going to produce 2 billion doses a year pretty soon as uh, they get batches of the yeast, presumably, from, from the United States. Now, the, ser the serious points here is the efficacy. Now, this started off, uh, efficacy against the original strain, 96%, absolutely spectacular, preventing mild, moderate and severe disease. Um, so that was the original strain when the vaccine programme was started. Efficacy against the B117, the UK variant, down to 86% against mild, moderate and severe disease. So we see that reduction. Efficacy against the South Africa variant, as quite a lot of studies were done in South Africa on this, down to 55%. So not working as well against the South Africa variant. And uh, these are interim results. They're not peer reviewed yet, but they're, they're pretty good results. They're not the final results, but uh, they're very indicative. And this 55% against mild, moderate and severe disease was in people who do not have HIV. Um, I don't have the data for those with HIV, but I believe it was less. So there we go, 96 down to 86 down to 55. Uh, but, as we mentioned yesterday with the Johnson & Johnson, um, and a very significant uh, difference or important thing to point out, is that this Nova, this, uh, Novavax was 100% effective against severe disease, including against the variants. So it was 100% effective. So what happened was in the trials in uh, the UK, the United States and South Africa, I think, all of the severe cases and the all of the very severe cases and the deaths were all in the in the placebo group. None were in the vaccine group. So again, we see a hundred percent protection against all the variants um, from from severe disease and death, just as we saw yesterday with the Johnson and Johnson. So even although some of these vaccines are not protecting against all disease as much as we'd like. They are data set after data set now is showing that more and more vaccines are protecting very completely, just like the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson yesterday we looked at against really severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths. So a reporter rang me up this morning and said, are you worried about the percentage of people? I think it was 14 or 16 percent in the UK expressing vaccine hesitancy. And I said, well, actually, I'm, I'm not that worried about that at the moment, because first of all, um, the limitation at the moment is supply of the vaccine. We're not particularly short of people to give it. We're not certainly not short of people turning up to receive it. Not at all. It's the supply that's the problem. Now, in the future, will vaccine hesitancy become a problem? Well, when this number fil filters through that you're 100 percent protected against severe, very severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths, I strongly suspect a lot of enlightened self-interest will take over and people will realise this. 
especially as, as the vaccine safety data continues to uh, accrue. Although more on that debate in a minute, although I'm still not particularly worried about it. Right, um, all severe cases are in the South Africa group. Uh, all, all, the, all the severe cases are in the placebo group in the UK and South Africa data. So the guy in charge of research at Novavax, I think he is, um, our take on this is a very, this is a very good result, I would agree. It's important to prevent severe disease, of course, and of course it would be nice <laughs> to prevent all disease. Uh, but it doesn't do that. But it did. There was no deaths in the vaccine group. So again, you know, another vaccine. Basically, all the vaccines are showing this similar pattern now. And that, that uh, Novavax vaccine should be approved uh, in April and should be getting rolled out by May. I'm very optimistic about it. Now, the United States, Mr. Biden uh, addressing the nation, all adults to be eligible for vaccination by 1st of May. So he's instructed the states to try and facilitate this. So that means anyone who wants a vaccine on the 1st of May just has to ask for it. And his aim is that there will be a... Uh, that the 4th of July um, will be uh, Independence from Virus Day. So 4th of July, 1776, freedom from some European power or other. Um, so let's hope that... Uh, Independence Day 2021, these truths will be self-evident. Independence from the virus. So it's a good time, it's a good time to aim for. It gives kind of structure to, to, the, to the effort. But that's his aim. First of May, anyone who wants a vaccine can get one. Now, he did caution, direct quote from the president, a lot can happen, conditions can change. The scientists have made clear that things may get worse again as new variants of the virus spread. So this is still the concern for the states. But the more people that are vaccinated, the less deaths it will result in. Uh, he's instigating a Find a Vaccine website, which is supposed to be a very good one. It's going to be a, an all singing or dancing website, hopefully, because websites and phone links have been a bit of a bottleneck in the UK. It's going to include all sorts of healthcare professionals, including dentists and uh, veterinarians, to give vaccines, which of course is eminently suitable. Both groups are already highly skilled. Vets are just amazing. They can do all sorts of things. I would certainly be more than happy to be uh, injected by, by, uh, by my local vet. Uh, doubling the number of pharmacies uh, participating, so that's good. Doubling the number of federally run massive uh, mass vaccination centres. Um, maintaining current pace of 2 million a day, impressive. Uh, but the actual number at the moment is uh, over 2.2 million doses of vaccine being given per day in the United States. Now, Mr. Trump has been... Uh, speaking about the rollout of the vaccine. Now, Mr. Trump wanted to make the point, and you can see his point, but that, that the, the vaccine programmes were instigated in his, uh, in his uh, premiership presidency. Um, but that's not the point I'm trying to make today. President Trump called it a beautiful shot. That beautiful shot in, in uh, his characteristic way of speaking, but it's very clear. So Mr. Trump is saying the vaccine is a beautiful shot. So let's hope that that means that there'll be none of this political goings on uh, and political differentiation that have bedogged, really, the response to the pandemic in the United States. So all the I don't know about Jimmy Carter, but but um, I think he's quite old now. But but um, certainly President Bush, uh, President Barack Obama. Um, all, all the former uh, President uh, Clinton have all publicly, um, publicly either been vaccinated or publicly approved the vaccine. Uh, obvi obviously, the current president, Mr. Biden, is approving it and Mr. Trump is calling it a beautiful shot. So good to see that um, all, all, all political leanings in the United States should now be encouraged to take the vaccine. Um, now, the US Olympic and uh, Paralympic uh, Committee have not been vaccinating their adults ahead of schedule, which is kind of good because, um, you know, elites, whether it's in sport or politics, should be vaccinated the same as everyone else. 
So that I, that I approve of that. I think that I think that's good. We don't want people jumping the gun just because they're particularly clever at everything. I mean, you're particularly clever at something. It might not be running round tracks remarkably quickly, um, but 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 um, I'm, I'm pleased to see they've taken that approach and not sort of jumping the uh, jumping the queue. But China's offered vaccines to all Olympic competitors. So it's hard to ignore the sort of geopolitical influences here and the, and the vac vaccine diplomacy. Olympics, of course, due for the 23rd of July. Still think it's a stupid idea. That's in Tokyo. Beijing Games will be the Winter Olympics. And the, the vaccine, of course, is the Sinovac and the Sinopharm. Uh, and, and that's already pledged to 45 uh, countries. Um, Sinovac, some question over e efficacy of Sinovac, but we don't know because the phase three data on neither of these vaccines has been published. So we really need some more transparency there from the from the Chinese uh, pharmaceutical authorities and get that phase three data out there and get it published so we all know. I mean, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Russian uh, Sputnik uh, vaccine, full peer reviewed um, phase three trial, data all published transparent everyone knows that it works uh, chinese ones not published um would like to know um china apparently is focusing on vaccinating people in the 18 to 59 year old age group who of course are the ones that are most likely to spread the uh the virus now i know there's a lot of older people in china concerned about this but given that there's essentially no community spread of the virus in China at the moment, I can see where they're coming from on this, um, that they want to prevent spread. And of course, if spread is prevented, older people will not be um, infected by, by definition. So that, that, that seems to be the strategy in China at the moment. And uh, it, it does make sense because they don't have the endemic virus that we have. So there's not such urgency to protect the older population as there clearly is in Europe, the UK and the United States. Canada, way behind. Vaccinate adults by the end of September. Way behind. They can't get the supplies. And uh, as we looked at on our talks with Lindsay, they are frantically trying to build vaccine producing facilities in Canada, but they won't be ready this year. A couple of countries to keep an eye on that are a bit of a concern. Um, Kenya. Uh, other African countries as well, but Kenya is the one where there's more data um, they've extended the curfew for 60 days um, quite a lot of cases so far despite very limited testing probably more deaths than that 1899 officially reported deaths but what's concerning is in the last few days the test positivity rate's gone up to 13 percent whereas january it was two percent and of course this is largely due to the spread of the south africa variant kenya protected by its um younger demographic but quite a lot of hiv still in kenya and um it's um it's a high positivity rate so basically it's kind of like a third wave in kenya it represents uh, and, and in other african countries italy as well uh, mostly the uk variant here uh, 25, 26,000 cases in the last 24 hours, 373 deaths in the past 24 hours, well over 100,000 deaths now. It seems to be localised, so Lombardy, uh, Lazio is a populated area around about Rome, uh, and quite a few other areas um, are locking down from Monday, and uh, they're going to be high risk red zones if there are over 250 weekly cases per 100,000. So, um, Patchy in Italy responding with localised lockdowns um, but what we'd feared uh, might happen as a result of the spread of the uh, the new variant so not entirely unexpected really but still you know Italy's been suffering for a long time now now the story of the Oxford AstraZeneca suspension uh, suspension of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine now, if you watched yesterday's video, we looked at, looked at this in great detail. We looked at the epidemiology of um, this venothromboembolism, this blood clot disease where blood clots form in the veins and go to the lungs. Uh, and, and we saw from the epidemiology that there were certainly no more cases 
in the vaccinated population than there was in an equivalent number of the unvaccinated population. That's that's the data we looked at yesterday, and that's what. Um, look at yesterday's video. We argued that in some detail. But Italy, Rome, and Thailand have now suspended the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Denmark, Norway, and Iceland did yesterday. I think adding on to Austria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, who uh, just suspended the specific batch. We believe uh, Austria, I think, has just suspended. Yeah, Austria just suspended the particular batch. So. Um, surprising that these larger countries with high levels of analytical facilities have decided to do this Germany health minister um, no evidence of an increase in blood clots with AstraZeneca vaccine I regret that some of the European Union have suspended vaccines of AstraZeneca from what we know so far the benefits far greater than the risk and as we saw yesterday it looks like the risk of blood clots is certainly no higher in the vaccinated group than in the unvaccinated group. So I must say a little bit bemused by this um, so far. France and the UK, of course, have looked at this and are carrying on. European Medicines Agency have stated, the direct quote, blood clots no higher than seen in the general population. So this idea that Europe all moves together um, it basically seems to be out the window now. Um, European Medicines Agency saying one thing, Italy, Romania, okay, Thailand's not in Europe, but Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Austria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg saying something else. Um, now, this was new. I only came across this when I was just preparing just about an hour ago, actually, so no detail on this yet, but this is from the European Medicines Agency as well. Uh, it's not yet clear uh, whether there is a causal association between vaccination and reports of immune thrombocytopenia now this is not the blood clots this is the opposite so thrombo thrombocytes are the platelets and whenever you see penio on the end with blood it means reduced numbers so this is reduced numbers of thrombocytes and the thrombocytes are the platelets that trigger the blood clotting so in thrombocytopenia there's not enough thrombocytes so there's reduced blood clotting so it looks like they're looking into that now as well. So they have been worried about increased blood clotting. Now it looks like they're worried about reduced blood clotting. Uh, end of knowledge is all I know about it. They've just started looking at that today as far as I know. So we'll keep an eye on that. But we do know that France, Germany and the UK have made a deliberate decision to carry on. It's not that they haven't got round to looking at it. <laughs> Our regulatory bodies have looked at it and they've decided there's nothing to worry them at the moment. World Health Organization has weighed in. AstraZeneca vaccine, excellent vaccine, they say, as are the other vaccines that are being used. They're saying it's safe. Uh, World Health Organization team saying we've reviewed the data on deaths. There's been no deaths to date proven to have to be caused by uh, vaccination. So WHO uh, happy there. Now, I know we've criticized the WHO before, but they have specialized teams that are very good at this sort of thing. So. I think we have to differentiate between quibbles we might have with WHO leadership and, and the expertise on the ground. Um, UK, now this is, this is somewhat significant and this is being investigated by the European Medicines Agency. Uh, severe allergic reactions are slightly higher with the Ast Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. There's been 41 anaphylactic reactions from 5 million given doses. Still fairly low, but higher than with other vaccines. So what I would expect now, the, the people that have had these reactions are people that are prone, to, nearly always people that are prone to reactions. They know they're prone to the actions. None of them have died. This is something we can treat. Um, but the people would feel pretty bad for a period of time. So most of them knew there was a risk and would have been supervised. But it's still higher than we would expect with normal vaccinations, even though it's only 41 in, a, in 5 million. And um, the, the, uh, the vaccine production people will probably be modifying the vaccines to reduce the risk of allergy. So it's one to keep an eye on, but it, but keep it in perspective. 41 over 5 million, most of them had known history of allergies and it can be accounted for and uh, treated. Um, but of course, this is why we give vaccines by medically trained, uh, with medically trained supervision, of course. Um, there is always a risk with everything that we give that actually works. Um, but that is a risk that can be very much managed. 
And I think we'll just finish today with a quick um, look at the global uh, vaccination status. So the states, 19.3 um, of the population got at least one shot, 10.2 fully vaccinated, so good. Uh, the UK, slightly higher numbers overall, uh, 37 doses given per 100 people. 34.5 of the population got at least one shot, which of course is the, uh, didn't mean to do that, which of course is the strategy we're doing in the UK to have the longer gap between the doses. So we can see the difference in that strategy there. Now, European countries still, um, or Canada, um, still uh, serious supply issues in Canada, unfortunately. Canada ordered very well, ordered lots and lots and lots of vaccines, but uh, supply issues. Uh, European countries still, I mean, if we think of the UK, they're at 37 and the US at 30 per 100. Then we see, what, n just under 10 for France and uh, Spain 11. Germany 10, so similar numbers, similarly low numbers in the European countries there. Uh, Israel, 100 doses, uh, where are we? There are 100 doses for 100 people, that's 56.1% of the population got at least one shot. 44.2 are fully vaccinated, leading the uh, charge in Israel. Uh, United Arab Emirates also doing uh, fairly well there, probably second. Saudi Arabia, not as well in Saudi Arabia. So Israel, it looks like Israel, United Arab Emirates, um, UK, United States in that order doing well. See, China, not so many in its own country. Uh, Russia, not so many in its own country, despite China and Russia exporting very large amounts of vaccine. Australia have made a start. New Zealand has had a very small batch, I think. So they've given to a few um, quarantine hotel workers, but that's about it for for New Zealand. Um, look at this for yourself. Just click on it and go onto it. It's remarkably interesting. Uh, once you get onto it, it's kind of hard to leave it, but we, uh, we will uh, because you can look at it uh, yourself. OK, some good news, uh, some confirmation of things that we already knew and uh, great optimism in the States. Overall, I'm, I'm feeling quite optimistic now. The, the thing that really encourages me is these 100% efficacy rates against severe disease, hospitalisation and death. So even if cases do carry on, the vaccines will break the link between the number of cases and the number of deaths and they will go down dramatically. So let, let, let's just leave it today with that, that word of encouragement. Thank you, of course, for, for watching.